The most popular CPU series of the past five years or so has been AMD's Ryzen 5 range, with parts like the 3600 selling in incredible volumes. Then following on from that, we had the 5600X that was also very popular, and despite a delayed release, the non-X version proved to be another amazingly popular part. The 5600X didn't exactly thrill us with its $300 US MSRP, it was about $100 over what we were hoping for, but I suppose compared to competing parts at the time it still represented pretty great value, and as is often the case, AMD were pretty quick to apply some hefty discounts. And then eventually, almost a year and a half later, they did release the standard 5600, so the non-X model, at $200 US, and we're much more pleased with that. And again, it was quickly discounted despite already entering at a relatively competitive price. It dropped down as low as $120 US, and it could often be found pretty well around $130 US, so a great buy there. So needless to say, the Ryzen 5 5600 and 5600X were always competitively priced, and for gamers on a tight budget, they did represent excellent value. But how well have they aged? And should you have bought an 8-core or even a 16-core model instead? Well, before we find out... Today's sponsor spot is brought to you by Antec and the new Constellation series of ATX cases. The C8 comprises both ARGB and non-ARGB models with both black and white variants available. The C8 ARGB features a seamless 45 degree beveled glass edge, giving it that popular minimalist design while also providing a dual chamber for independent cooling. It also comes with a pair of 160mm Tranquil Reverse ARGB PWM fans and a single 140mm fan with a built-in fan control hub that can be synced directly with your motherboard. The top, bottom and right sides can accommodate a trio of 360mm radiators simultaneously for those who want to ensure ample cooling or just go nuts with their ARGB. Or for those of you who aren't particular fans of RGB effects, there is a non-ARGB version available as well. So for more information and to check out the rest of Antec's range, please check the link in the video description. Okay, so despite the 5600 series offering gamers excellent value, at least in our opinion, not everyone was convinced, some claiming that the 5600 series was a poor investment and therefore gamers should look to the Ryzen 7 5800X or the 5700X which was released alongside the 5600. Some went as far as to say the Ryzen 9 5950X or BUST, which we thought was borderline crazy, but hey, maybe they were right. It's been three and a half years since the Zen 3 processors were first released, so today I want to see how they compare in modern games. Obviously the 5600X is going to be slower than the 5800X, and therefore the 5950X, but the question is, how much slower? And how usable is it today? It's also well worth looking back at the pricing, because it's not like the 5950X was ever affordable, though a strong case could certainly be made for the 5700X as a gaming CPU, and we certainly made that case back in the day. Really, as we saw it, the smart options for gamers were the Ryzen 5 5600 and Ryzen 7 5700X. Both offered exceptional value at their release prices, and as I said, continued to drop in price. By early 2023, the 5600 was a much better deal than the 5600X, while the 5700X was also a much better deal than the 5800X, both offering a 24% discount for basically the same level of performance. Meanwhile, the 5950X, that cost a little over 160% more than the 5700X, and a little bit over 280% more than the 5600. So, I guess you could say at $500 US, it was quite a bit more expensive. Now, with the 5600 and 5700X being virtually identical in terms of performance, and of course they're both unlocked CPUs, and then the same applies to the 5700X and 5800X, I'm not going to test all of these CPUs and clutter the data. So instead we're comparing the 5600X, 5800X, 5950X, and for those of you 3D vCache lovers, the 5800X 3D will also be thrown in. So I hope you're happy with that. All have been tested using 32 gigabytes of DDR4 3600CL14 memory with an RTX 4090. So let's get into it. First up, we have Assassin's Creed Mirage, and at 1080p, the 5600X is very close to the 5800X, which is what we typically found three years ago. The 5800X was just 2.5% faster for the average frame rate and 7% faster for the 1% lows. 
Then we have the 5950X, which was faster again, boosting the average frame rate over the 5600X by 10% with a 16% uplift to those 1% lows, so that's a pretty nice gain, but not exactly worth paying well over three times more for. Really, the hero here is of course the 5800X 3D, which was 40% faster than the 5600X. Now I've also included some 4K data, as this is always heavily requested, despite my best efforts to explain that it can be very misleading. What we're looking at here is mostly the limits of the RTX 4090 using the ultra high preset at 4K, but if you enable upscaling or of course lower the quality settings, the margins will start to become more in line with what we see at 1080p, so keep that in mind as we move forward. Moving on to Helldivers 2, we see even less of a difference between the 5600X, 5800X and 5950X basically all three parts delivered comparable performance at 1080p. The 5800X 3D was much faster, boosting the average frame rate by at least 27%, so L3 cache is quite clearly the key here, not core count, and we found this to be the case more often than not when it comes to gaming performance. Now this is an interesting one, Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart. The performance uplift from the 5600X to the 5800X was quite dramatic, as here the 8-core processor was a massive 27% faster at 1080p, and that's not far from perfectly linear core scaling. The 1% lows were 13% greater, but still a huge performance increase there for the 8-core model, though of course the 5600X still delivered a solid experience overall. Then at 4K, the 5600X was the only CPU that couldn't max out the RTX 4090, but for what was an almost $200 US part upon release, I think 110 FPS on average is okay here, and having played through the game for 20 minutes with the 5600X to get a bit of a feel for it, I can report back that frame time performance was excellent. Spider-Man Remastered also sees performance scale up with core count, though as we often see, L3 cache is far more important for boosting frame rates. In this example, the 5800X was 11% faster than the 5600X, while the 5950X was 25% faster. That said, the 5800X 3D, that thing was 15% faster than the 5950X, and a whopping 44% faster than the 5600X. So the 5950X was a good bit faster than the 5600X in this example, but with 140 FPS on average and 117 FPS for those 1% lows, the 6-core Zen 3 processor was hardly slow. Cyberpunk 2077 Phantom Liberty is a very CPU intensive title, and yet the 5600X, 5800X and 5950X were all very competitive in terms of FPS performance. Certainly nothing like what we saw in Ratchet and Clank for example. Still, this is another game where AMD's 3D vCache helps a lot, boosting the performance of the 5800X 3D to the point where it was 32% faster than the 5950X. Then at 4K we are heavily GPU limited to just shy of 80 FPS, so not amazing performance there, and you'll probably go and enable upscaling in an effort to get around maybe 100 FPS. Hogwarts Legacy is another CPU demanding game, and while the 8 and 16 core models are faster, they're not really that much faster. The 5800X for example was just 9% faster than the 5600X, while the 5950X offered mixed performance. There's possibly a scheduling issue here. So you are definitely getting better performance with the 8 core parts, but it's hard to say if that makes them better value compared to the 6 core models. Horizon Forbidden West appears to play as well with the 5600X as it does the 5800X and 5950X. We're talking about a mere 3% increase from the 5600X to the 5800X. Meanwhile, the 5800X 3D was up to 25% faster than the 5950X. Dragon's Dogma 2 is known to be a very CPU intensive game, or at least a very CPU bound game, and yet the 5800X was just 4% faster than the 5600X, while the 5950X was just 9% faster. And this suggests to me that while this is a CPU bound game, it's not that CPU intensive in the sense that it doesn't seem to be utilizing these CPUs to their full potential. The 5800X 3D, on the other hand, that was 36% faster, so again, L3 cache is king, and while adding more cores certainly does help even in this example, it wasn't exactly a significant improvement, and the 5600X was still very usable with just 6 cores. 
Another game where the 5600X performs really well is Baldur's Gate 3, as here we see the 5800X is offering just a 6% performance improvement, while the 5950X is 13% faster. And this means we have another example where those extra cores, they do lead to a performance improvement, but it's not that significant. What does boost performance significantly though is 3D vCache, as we see the 5800X 3D offering 51% more performance than the 5600X and 42% more than the 5800X. The Last of Us Part 1 is a CPU demanding title that does lean on the 5600X very heavily, and as a result the 5800X was 14% faster. Meanwhile, the 5800X and 5950X, they were comparable, and again the 5800X 3D delivered the best performance overall. Finally, we have Starfield, and here we have another example where the 6-core processor struggles to keep pace with the 5800X, though performance overall is still quite good and the experience was certainly very playable. The 1% lows were in excess of 60fps throughout our testing. The 5800X was 15% faster than the 5600X, and then we see that the 5950X was 23% faster, so quite a significant margin there. Finally, here's a look at the average performance seen across the 11 games tested, calculated using the GeoMean. Here we see that on average the 5800X was 9% faster than the 5600X, while the 5950X was 14% faster. Then, for a serious performance bump, the 5800X 3D was 39% faster and 27% faster than the 5800X. Now, out of interest, here's the 11 game average data from our 5600X Day 1 review, which was published back in November of 2020. Here, the 5950X was just 4% faster than the 5600X on average, and we only saw two examples where it was 12% faster. So games have certainly become more CPU demanding over the last three and a half years, but of course that was to be expected and it'll shock exactly nobody. So there you have it. In many of today's most demanding AAA games, the Ryzen 5 5600X was on average just 8% slower than the 5800X and then 12% slower than the 5950X. So not bad given how much cheaper it was upon release and then throughout the life of that product. And not only that, but performance overall, I think it's fair to say was excellent, as there wasn't a single example where frame rates weren't comfortably above 60 FPS when CPU bound. Now, if you go back to when the 5600X and 5800X were first released, along with the 5950X, it is pretty hard to make a case for the higher core count parts for gamers on a tight budget. Simply saying, spend more because more cores better and more future proof, well, I don't think that cuts it. Upon release, the 5800X, it did cost 50% more than the 5600X, so $150 US extra, and that's far from nothing, especially for those of you on a tight budget. And although we did acknowledge back then that the extra cores would be nice to have, if you could afford them, they were hardly a requirement for gaming. And three and a half years later, that's as true as ever, though it is now much easier to make a case for the upgrade to those higher core count parts as there are multiple examples where uh, the performance uplift was pretty reasonable. It might not offset the core or the cost completely, but there were some real performance upgrades to be had. The Ryzen 9 5950X though, that was absurd for gaming, it really still is to this day. The 5800X 3D for example, completely annihilated it, it offered 22% better performance on average, and that's a much bigger margin than we see between the 5600X and 5950X, despite there being a 167% increase in cores in that particular example. Of course, if you were also tackling core heavy productivity workloads, then the 5950X certainly would have made sense, but strictly for gaming, it was never a good choice. So it's fair to say anyone who upsold gamers on a 5950X just for gaming really did screw them out of quite a lot of money. To be clear though, I don't think all gamers should have necessarily bought a Ryzen 5 5600 series processor either, just as I don't think all gamers should buy a Ryzen 5 or Core i5 processor today. What I thought three and a half years ago is what I still think today. These products are viable options, they're priced appropriately, and they present as excellent solutions for gamers on a more limited budget. Sadly though, it's now Intel who generally offers much better value than AMD at the entry level end of the market. And this is something AMD will need to address with AM5 if they wish to capture the retail market end to end as they've done in the past.
All said and done, it was really interesting to find a few examples where the 5600X was starting to fall behind the higher core count parts by a meaningful margin. Games such as Ratchet and Clank, Spider-Man, Starfield, and The Last of Us Part 1. That said, had I included 50 games or so, so modern games and many popular titles that were released over the last few years, the overall margins would be reduced, as most games won't be demanding enough to put a lot of stress on the 5600X. Now, circling back to some recently published content, it's important to note that you shouldn't buy a CPU for gaming, or anything really, based on core count. What matters is overall CPU performance. For example, the 5800X 3D was much faster than the 5950X in this testing, despite packing half as many cores, and the new Ryzen 5 7600, that's comparable to the 5800X 3D, despite offering two fewer cores and a lot less L3 cache. Core count's really only semi-relevant when comparing CPUs of the same architecture, while it's likely going to be next to useless when comparing CPUs of different architectures, like what we find when comparing Zen 3 and Zen 4 parts. And it becomes much more complicated with Intel's P-Core and E-Core enabled parts. Then moving on from that, there's also the resolution angle, and while I'm sure those of you who crave 4K CPU benchmarking will be tickled pink, remember, it's not about the resolution, but rather your target frame rate. For example, if you desire 144 FPS in Cyberpunk 2077, then the discovery that the RTX 4090 will only deliver around 75 FPS at 4K using the Ultra preset, it's not super useful. In that specific example, all we're doing is testing the RTX 4090, as all CPUs were capable of driving 70 to 80 FPS in that test. What you need to know is, can the CPU achieve your desired frame rate and if so, what settings do you need to use in order for your GPU to render those frames? So in short, GPU limited 4K testing using ultra or high quality settings with an RTX 4090 tells you almost nothing useful about CPU performance and probably the performance of your own system. And it's certainly nothing that you can't learn from looking at the 1080p data. And that's going to do it for this video. That is everything. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this sort of recap of the Ryzen 5000 series Zen 3. I found it quite interesting to see how those CPUs all compare in modern games. So if you like the video, you know what to do. Subscribe for more content. And if you'd like to become a Floatplane or Patreon member, one of those two, you can get access to our exclusive Discord server for members only, monthly live streams, behind the scenes content, and Q&A stuff. So check that out if you're interested. But if not, that's perfectly fine. And I would like to thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time.